This is Living History Footnotes for New Market's Ghost Canal. If you haven't seen the main episode yet, please check it out first. I will link it in the description. In today's episode, we'll talk more about the canals of the day, and we'll explore how Newmarket might be different if its own canal had been built. All that and more, so let's get into it. This week's featured comment comes from Reddit user Section111. They write, I'm a fan, so much so that a friend of mine and I made up a little canoe club to take part in this year's Marsh Mash. I think we were the first boat in the 46 year history of the event to capsize. Appropriate. Yeah, that does seem appropriate considering the whole canal project basically went belly up itself. They also sent along this photo of their uh, custom t-shirts for the event. Thank you very much for sending that along. We talked in the main episode about how the New Market Canal was meant to be a part of the Trent Severn waterway system. and. That waterway could be the subject of probably an entire season of Living History videos, so I'm just going to give a quick overview about that project. The Trent Severn waterway was originally planned for military purposes to get troops from east to west much more efficiently. Eventually it was shelved, but it would come back after the War of 1812 more for commercial purposes at this time. It was seen as the backbone of a mass transportation system into the Kawarthas, both for people and for goods, because the Kawarthas were notably very difficult to get into. The Trent Canal was an extremely political project as well, but more on that in a moment. Construction would happen off and on for decades, and it wouldn't get finished until about 1920. In some ways, the Trent Severn Canal was a bit of a failure, and that might be expected considering it took almost a hundred years from when construction first started to when it was finished. One of the issues was ship sizes. Ships had gotten a lot bigger from the time the canal project was started to when it would eventually open, and it didn't make financial sense to use smaller ships to get the same amount of goods across. The other issue was the growth of alternative transportation systems like railways, which had become much more numerous and were often much more efficient at transporting goods, even if they did take a bit of a higher cost. However, the canal would come back strong with a different purpose, and that was pleasure boating. The canal now carries more than 100,000 boats every year, and it's become known as a world-class sailing and power boating destination. The entire 300 plus kilometer length is now managed by Parks Canada as a national historic site. This makes me wonder what a canal might have meant for Newmarket. If it had its own water link to the Great Lakes, it might have benefited from those traffic levels. And theoretically, it could still be benefiting from those today. There's old photos as well that show the Davis Tannery standing right next to where the turning basin would have been at the end of the canal. Now that was just one business among many in Newmarket that may have had significant impacts from a canal system. However, as we just said, and as we learned in the main video, railways had become quite dominant by this point, and the expansion of roads and highways was not far off. So just what sort of an impact a canal might have had? It's tough to say. There's a couple of political points that I'd like to discuss here too. First, there was the Conservatives that immediately cancelled the canal project as soon as they got elected, but a very similar thing happened with the Trent Severn Canal back in 1896, except it was the opposite situation. The Conservatives were originally in power, and they had been getting a lot of good publicity from their work supporting the Trent Canal. So when the Liberal government took over, they cancelled a lot of the work that the Conservatives had done in their own home ridings, and instead shifted work to the Liberal ridings. So very interesting that a very similar playbook was used just a few decades earlier and on the opposite political spectrum. The other one is that the Newmarket Canal originally had cross-party support before it devolved into a political dumpster fire. The original group that went to Ottawa to advocate for the canal was a whole mix of people, but generally it was made up of business owners in the Newmarket area who felt that their businesses could benefit from having a shipping canal in the town. If you want to learn more about the canal and other history from this area, Richard McLeod has done some excellent writing on Newmarket's history. I've linked to some of his stories in the description, including this one about the life of Sir William Mulock. Richard is also on social media under The History Hound and is very much worth a follow. That'll do it for this week's episode of Living History Footnotes for New Market's Ghost Canal. As always, I encourage you to go out and visit these places for yourself. Take a photo, upload to Instagram, use hashtag livinghistoryca, and tag my account, it's also at livinghistoryca. 
Next week, we've got a new episode of Living History coming your way. It's going to take us to an iconic bridge in Northern Ontario. It is a vital lifeline for tens of thousands of people, the only road on and off of an island, but it's falling apart. Until then, be well. Thank you.